welcome back to the Wellness Paradox podcast. I'm so grateful you've joined us on this journey towards greater human flourishing. As always, I'm your host, Michael Stack, an exercise physiologist by training and a health entrepreneur and a health educator by trade. And I'm fascinated by a phenomena that I call the wellness paradox. That is the gap between what we know as a health sciences community and what we actually do in the real world to make a real difference with real people. This podcast is all about closing off those gaps by disseminating the latest, most evidence-based, and most engaging information in the health sciences. And to do that today, I'm joined by Orrin Hesterman. Orrin is the founder of the Fair Food Network, an Ann Arbor, Michigan-based nonprofit that developed a program called Double Up Food Bucks. Double Up Food Bucks is a federally subsidized program that allows individuals who have access to the SNAP benefit program, which are food stamps, to use those benefits to double their spending power on healthy foods like fruits and vegetables. This is an amazing discussion from a man who had a vision around how to make healthy eating more sustainable and more affordable for communities in need and then actually put that vision into motion and made it a reality by intense lobbying and actually getting this program to be subsidized in the annual farm bill. I think this is a great discussion around a number of different topics, but particularly the role that social support, society and social programs can play in making our population healthier. Indeed, it isn't always personal responsibility that drives personal health. It's the social scaffolding that exists that allow certain segments of our population to actually become healthier and live more fulfilled lives. So I think this is a great conversation to listen to, not just because of what the Double Up Food Bucks program provides and how you can support this kind of a program, but also the vision that one man had to make something a reality that is so critical on our society. So I truly hope you enjoy this discussion with Orrin. For more information on anything we talk about, please go to the show notes page at wellnessparadoxpod.com forward slash episode seven. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Orrin Hesterman. Orrin, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Well, this is a really exciting conversation for me because I've known Orrin for several years uh, as a friend, and I've I've watched you know Fair Food grow over time as a as a local organization here in Ann Arbor. And for starters, Orrin, just just tell us a little bit more about your your background first before we even get into Fair Food to provide some context for our conversation. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, you know, I, I've. Uh, been in Michigan uh, really for all of my uh, professional career, having uh, transplanted myself from Northern California uh, when I was still in college uh, and uh, started my career at Michigan State University as a professor of crop and soil sciences. Uh, so my background is agricultural science, but I've always been involved with food and agriculture. That's that's my passion and purpose. Um, after a start of a career, uh, about 12 years at Michigan State, I was then recruited to come to the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, one of our great uh, philanthropic organizations here in the state of Michigan, uh, to help them develop and then run their sustainable food and agriculture program, the grant-making program that really was national in scope. So I had a chance to work with uh, visionaries, pioneers, leaders all over the country that you know, we're really starting to establish the local food, organic food movement um, back, you know, 20, 25 years ago. Uh, And then uh, about 13 years ago, left the Kellogg Foundation to uh, start Fair Food Network, a nonprofit organization headquartered in Ann Arbor with our mission to uh, grow community health and wealth through food. Yeah, and that's that's I find what Fair Food does, you know, so fascinating. Un- unpack that a little bit more for us. You know, community health and wealth through you know sustainable food. You know, what what does that mean, and how, how is that actually operationalized to a degree in the real world? Yeah, um, thanks for asking that, Mike. You know, uh, being involved in food and agriculture and food systems work 
for virtually my whole career, um, coming at it from a scientist, a businessman, a philanthropist, and now a nonprofit leader uh, and an academic, uh, I've really come to realize so strongly how uh, food really impacts everything. And that uh, especially when we look at uh, a situation right now where the the pandemic has really helped us um, see in really stark relief some of the um, gaps we have in our society about who has access and who doesn't, who has access to healthy food and who doesn't, who has access to food security, who doesn't, who has access to capital to keep their businesses afloat and who doesn't. And uh, the, the real purpose of Fair Food Network is really focusing on those families and communities that uh, will tend to get left behind, that historically have been excluded from access to healthy food and a healthy life, uh, but deserve it like the rest of us. Um, so when we talk about growing community health and wealth through food, we're really talking about, especially in those communities that have been uh, marginalized, have been historically excluded. And the, the way we started our, our work, because, you know, that's kind of a lofty goal, right? So uh, at some point you have to say, well, how do you take that lofty goal at 30,000 feet and actually bring it to the ground? And the way we brought it to the ground 12 years ago when we started Fair Food Network was with a program that we now call Double Up Food Bucks. And that's a program that uh, enables any uh, individual or family that's receiving um, SNAP benefits, supplemental nutrition assistance benefits, used to be called food stamps. And in Michigan, you access these with a, with a bridge card. You know, it's a, it's a debit card that you receive from the, from the state of Michigan if you qualify. Uh, anybody with a EBT card, a bridge card, can show up at a participating location and for every dollar of their food assistance benefits they spend on fresh produce, they will get an additional dollar of double up food bucks to spend on more produce. So the basic idea is that we are making uh, fresh fruits and vegetables more accessible to families who need it most. And uh, we also focus on making sure that um, the fruits and vegetables that are accessed through the double up program are to a large measure produced by Michigan farmers. So we say this is a win-win-win. Uh, families who need the uh, nutrition are bringing home more healthy food at an affordable price. Farmers are getting new customers and making more money, local farmers. And those food dollars are staying in our local community, our local economy to create jobs and economic activity in our communities. So that win-win-win uh, has, has really become a powerful force to help grow the Double Up program from um, a pilot at Detroit Eastern Market and a few other small farmers markets in Detroit back in 2009 to now a program that is uh, over 250 sites throughout the state of Michigan, farmers markets, farm stands, and grocery stores. And now working, uh, Fair Food Network is now working with uh, organizations in 26 additional states on double up programs. And so they are now in over a thousand uh, retail locations, uh, benefiting hundreds of thousands of families and thousands of farmers. Um, so we, we could talk a little bit more about how that expansion happened, but we're, I'm really proud of our staff at Fair Food Network, proud of all our supporters that we were able to take this lofty idea of building community health and wealth, bring it to the ground with a program and then scale that program so it's really affecting a lot of, of families in a positive way now. Yeah, it, it, it is so amazing. There's, there's, there's so much to, to dive into from what you just said there, because I think the, the information is so, it's so timely and topical given everything that we're, we're struggling with right now. I'm, I'm curious, I think the first thing that comes to mind for me is how, it, how, have, you, how have you been able to achieve this scale in the manner that you have, because this is this is no small feat, yet it's still, I'm quite sure knowing you well, not at the scale that you want it to be yet. So how, right. how you achieve the scale and then what's the plan to achieve greater scale? Right. So, you know, uh, with, with all of our work at Fair Food Network, which includes the Double Up program and also includes something we now call the Fair Food Impact Initiative, 
where we are working to make sure that uh, entrepreneurs, food entrepreneurs in the same community, same type of communities that the Double Up program is impacting, entrepreneurs that are producing healthy uh, products, healthy food for their community, that are creating jobs in those communities, that are sourcing from local farmers, um, and that are uh, paying attention to uh, environmental stewardship, that those entrepreneurs also are getting the support they need. Because building health and wealth in communities is both about accessing healthier food. It's also about building ownership of businesses in those communities. And one of the uh, first and easiest ways to do that is through the food system, through food businesses. So in both of these uh, uh, sort of approaches, what we think about is um, you can have a, a you can have a visionary idea about how you'd like the the world to be, how you would like the food system to be organized in the future. That's healthier for kids, healthier for the economy and communities, healthier for the environment. But at a certain point, you have to really think about okay, how do you scale a model so that that can actually happen? And my belief is that you got to do kind of two things at once. You have to have living, breathing examples of how to organize the system differently. So Double Up Food Bucks is a living, breathing example that's working of how you organize the marketplace, how you organize the retail space, how you organize uh, communities so that this kind of access to healthy food is a more regular part of, of everyday behavior. Uh, and at the same, in, in the same notion, you you create a living, breathing example of how to create a finance and business assistance mechanism so that we can see more smaller scale food businesses succeed, even in the time of a pandemic, pandemic, be able to succeed. So living, breathing examples of a different way to organize the system is important. And it's not enough. If you're going to scale something, you also need to think about like how to shift public policy, mm -hmm. how to shift policies to support those living, breathing examples. Um, you know, my, my belief is that if you're going to shift a system, I, I can't imagine how you do it without shifting policy, especially with food and agriculture. Um, we have a food system in place today that has largely uh, been created off of a blueprint that our federal government has, has put together over many years, over decades. You know, there's a, there's a single piece of legislation called the farm, we affectionately call it the farm bill. It takes on different names each five years when it's reauthorized by Congress and signed by the president. But that farm bill is about a trillion dollar bill every five years that really sets the stage for what our food system is gonna look like. Who's going to get supported? What kind of farmers are going to get supported? What kind of research gets supported? Um, what kind of education gets supported? Because that's all, you know, if you want to think about how the future is going to look, look at what's happening now with research and education and, and supports and subsidies. Um, so as we started the Double Up program, uh, we made sure that uh, our, our good friend um, and uh, representative Senator Debbie Stabenow knew about the program. Now, Debbie and I have been good friends and colleagues for many years, ever since I started my work at Michigan State University, and, and she was a local representative uh, up in the Lansing area. And we've really followed each other's careers, and I, I knew she'd be interested in this program. So I made sure that uh, with her love of Eastern Market, that uh, one day when we, uh, the market was open, the Double Up program was working for her to come see it in operation. So when it came that time in you know, we started the program, as I said, in 2009, when it came time in 2014 for uh, Debbie to work on creating uh, the next version of the farm bill. Um, she, with our help, included a provision in that farm bill to start bringing federal dollars into not just double up food bucks in Michigan, but into a new program at U.S. Department of Agriculture. USDA that could spread this idea across the country. And she was successful in doing that. And uh, then when the farm bill was reauthorized in 2018, it was reauthorized with even more money, $250 million uh, to, to continue scaling this program. 
So while you're right, Mike, I don't think we've even scratched the surface of where this kind of program can go, which we call nutrition incentives. We've got a, we've got a great start. Uh, and it's a, it's a great start because it's a public private partnership we have private philanthropy, putting money in to make this work. We have private retailers. We have private uh, entrepreneurs, farmers. Um, we've also got the state of Michigan now is, is, is on board helping to match some of those federal dollars. So we bring this whole package together to be able to support a program like this, uh, to be able to demonstrate the living, breathing example of how to do it in Michigan, and then um, be able to work with organizations all over the country so they can stand up similar type of program like Double Up Food Bucks in their communities. And it's happening. It's it's there are nutrition incentive programs now in every one of the 50 states in the country. Yeah, it's quite remarkable. You have you have done the the challenging work of the top down and the bottom up approach at the same time, which I think exactly. You know, when, I, when you look at any significant societal change, it, you're absolutely right. If you don't have policy supporting it, it's never going to happen. But if you don't have that living, breathing example, you don't have that groundswell of support, it's not going to get there. And I I marvel at the the idea that this is now something, and you you might as well on some level, that is included in the farm bill on a, on a every five-year basis that that funding is there. That's a, that's a testament to the work of, of you and your team, certainly. Yeah, it's, it's now... It's now part of what they call permanent uh, permanent law in the farm bill. Once you get once a program gets to be fifty million dollars annually or more, it becomes part of what they call baseline in the farm bill. So we we can uh, we can count on the federal money being there now every year to support these programs. Um, the big challenge we have is that uh, by uh, federal law the way it was put together, we need to match that federal money. So every dollar of federal money in the USDA has to be matched by a non-federal dollar for these programs. So while we have a $250 million program at the Department of Agriculture, it's really a half a billion dollar program now because you've got to have the matching. And that's one of, that's one of the biggest challenges that we're facing as an organization and that the field is facing is how do you, how do you manage the success on the policy level by by getting the the private and state donations you need. Yeah, and that's where that public private sector partnership really comes together and it's it's interesting in the conversations I have with many people uh, on this podcast, even thus far, and we even see this with the development of something like the COVID vaccines. Like it's very clear that, you know, public and private partnerships are a way to really accelerate any type of significant social change. I'm curious because I think there's, a lot of people listening to a podcast like this, that they're in the health sciences and they realize the role that policymakers can play in uh, helping advance their agenda and their initiative. Now, you had a relationship, a pre-existing relationship uh, with Debbie Stabenow, and obviously that's you know tremendously helpful. What is your what is your advice to actually make something like that a reality on the policy level? Because I'm sure it's not just enough to have a relationship with somebody like Debbie Stabenow. There, there, there's more that goes into it than that. What is how does someone even begin to wrap their head around you know, addressing things at a policy level? Because I know initially it can seem pretty intimidating and somewhat frustrating. So you you need to have. I mean, relationships are key without a doubt, but relationships can get established. Um, we, you know, we have, have had to establish and had the opportunity to establish relationships with lots of representatives around the country now to support this work. And we don't do it all. Um, you know, it's important that we have, for example, the, uh, the uh, director of the New Mexico Department of Agriculture, Jeff Witte is a, he's an important voice nationally in agriculture and in New Mexico. Well, there was a program in New Mexico, a double up program there. So it wasn't Fair Food Network that went and met with him to let him know about it. It was our partners in New Mexico. So always think about like, who are the important voices and how to build champions with these folks? And you don't just build the championship by talking about it. 
mean, we, you know, you've got to uh, have the evidence. So, um, I, I mean, I learned this uh, very um, strongly at Kellogg Foundation, how important program evaluation is. So from the start of the Double Up program and the start of our Fair Food Impact Initiative, we have had evaluation as uh, integral parts, part of the DNA of our work, that we're always um, um, developing the metrics that we need to measure. We're making sure that we are um, counting the numbers and we are make sure we are gathering the stories. You've got to have both stories and numbers. And then uh, we have a fabulous communications uh, department at Fair Food Network that puts together this information. You know, I might have a 40 page evaluation report that tells me all that I need to know about what's happening with Double Up Food Bucks. And I need a one or two pager mm-hmm. bring to representatives in Washington or Lansing. So you got to put it, put the information together. And, you know, even to the point of um, when we knew which legislators, either in Michigan or in Washington, D.C., we needed to contact and let them know about the program and how many farmers were being impacted and how many families were using it. We broke our information down. We broke the data down by congressional district. Mm. We were able to show, oh, here are all the markets and all the farmers markets and all the grocery stores in your district that are using Double Up Food Bucks. Here are some of the farmers. Listen to them. If you want to hear about the program, don't talk to me. Talk to the farmers in your district. Talk to the folks that are using the program. Um, And so, you know, you really need to, uh, as you said, Mike, having that connection between the the policy level and the grassroots and making sure that we are working as a facilitator of that communication rather than thinking we're making it happen we are really facilitating the communication so that that public policy can be informed by the actual um, experience on the ground. Yeah, and I think that framework is so important is that legislators respond to their constituents. And and what, what you said there about actually breaking it down to the level of here are the grocery stores in your community, here are the farmers in your community, um, that, that makes a difference. It's interesting, it's almost as if You've made you've made other people uh, the star of the story, and you're just the facilitator of the information to a great right. extent. That's an interesting. Absolutely. Strategy. Yep. Yep. You know, I I, uh, I am forever grateful by um, some of our farmers in Michigan. You know, I think of Case Visser and his family over in West Michigan. You know, they they grow on about 200 acres, a lot of vegetables, and they sell at about 20 farmers markets all over West Michigan. And when it came time to do a congressional briefing in Washington, D.C. about the Double Up program and its impact on farmers. I didn't go. I went to Case, visited him at the Grand Rapids, you know, farmer's market. And I said, uh, Case, uh, how would you like to take a trip to Washington, D.C.? And he said, yeah, I'm up for it. And so we we helped prepare him. But it was Case Visser who went and did a briefing on Capitol Hill, not not us at Fair Food Network. Um, because I knew that number one, they're going to get a more authentic voice from a farmer who's been involved in the program. And uh, they're going to hear that voice much differently than they would hear it from me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's uh, I think it's, it's just a great testament to having a good, good plan and, and executing it. What I'm curious to, to circle back on is you mentioned some of the, some of the data you collect. And I, I know, I know you're like me, a data person and not that I want to get too into the minutia and the details of the data, but talk to us about some of, some of the actual findings that your, your research has been able to show in terms of the, the outcome metrics. So with with the Double Up program, our outcome metrics are around um, sort of the the number of transactions per location, um, the amount of uh, SNAP money that's being spent on produce. And we can look at that as a percent, uh, you know, as well as um, absolute numbers. We look at the um, redemption percentage. So of uh, if you're earn of all of like every hundred dollars of double up food bucks that's being earned, how much of it is actually being spent? And that can vary from 25% in some grocery stores to over 95% in some farmers markets. So we look at that carefully because it helps inform um, where we might 
uh, have opportunities to do more in-depth communication or work with cashiers. We've got a great program now, a cashier engagement program mm. that we're trying to roll out where we're actually uh, helping cashiers at grocery stores become the the uh, the communicators about the program because they're really on, they're really the front line uh, of of this program in grocery stores, and that's been very successful. When you know we can measure um, what the double up uh, redemption is before we do a program like that, and then what it is after we do it to tell us how effective it is. Um, we um, do direct mail at times to um, families in the um, vicinity of certain grocery stores. And then we will look at the transaction number, the snap sales, the double up earnings and the double up, double up redemptions um, at that store uh, before and after. Um, we also measure the, uh, for grocery stores, we ask every grocery store partner to tell us both the absolute dollar amount and the percentage of produce that they're purchasing that are coming off of Michigan farms. Yeah. So we, you know, we want to have those numbers. We want to know. And uh, we started at uh, less than 15% as sort of a baseline. And now uh, last year we were up to 22% on average of, of all the produce that was purchased by the grocery stores was coming from Michigan farms. And so we, we think that's a success. Now, would I love it to be more? Absolutely. And it's a good start. Um, in our uh, Fair Food Impact Initiative, we're working with uh, this a larger collaborative called the Michigan Good Food Fund, which is a, um, a large investment fund with several investors that are able to um, loan money to entrepreneurs that are um, growing, start, starting and growing uh, food businesses of the kind that I had explained a little while ago. So there we are measuring um, the viability of the business, how many jobs were created or um, saved, you know, created or maintained in those businesses, what kind of uh, environmental stewardship practices they've got going on. We are especially now focused on with the entrepreneurs um, how many entrepreneurs of color are being supported? You know, we know that, um, you know, with uh, uh, the black population being the largest minority population in the state of Michigan, yet if we look at um, grocery store ownership, there are only two or three grocery stores that we can identify in the state of Michigan that are owned by African Americans. Mm. So we know there's work to be done. I mean, you know, that's part of the food system. So the more we can step in and uh, help uh, entrepreneurs, assist them with business assistance and with uh, financing to develop those grocery stores. And we've got one that we believe is going to be opening in North Flint uh, later this summer or breaking ground later this summer. And we're working with a couple of projects in Detroit. Um, so we're we're keeping track of metrics around the um, the demographics who who is actually participating in the programs and is the participate participation in either a double up or a, a fair food investment program um, mirroring the population of our state or are we um, are we unintentionally uh, following biases that have been in place for years and years and continuing to inadvertently uh, support the wealth gap that we know is here, because our goal is to shrink that gap, to shrink the health and wealth gap in these communities. Yeah, absolutely. One thing you said struck me earlier, and it was around the education component. And I, I find it fascinating and also very instructive that you are getting right to the cashier level as uh, per, to provide education. I'm curious on the consumer end of things. Uh, first, the awareness that programs like this exist, and then, you know, maybe even down to like what to do with the produce when you get it. Uh, how, how have you tailored some of your educational programs to the community members who are actually utilizing these benefits? Um, the education in terms of uh, letting people know about the program and how to use it is really key. That this is not something where it's like, you know, if you build it, they will come. You know, you got to build it and you got to let people know about it. 
And one of the biggest barriers we faced early on was you're giving me something for nothing. I'm not sure about that. Mm. You know, I've heard that story a lot. And uh, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Mm. For us to just get over the barrier that, yes, this is, I mean, you know, it's basically you spend a dollar, you're going to get another dollar. Uh, so that, that's been a bit, uh, you know, we've had to overcome that and find different ways to communicate about it for people to actually step in and try it. And we know that the, the most effective form of communication is uh, person to person. Uh, so, you know, trying to really uh, get people to tell each other, tell their families, tell their friends about it. We also have uh, what we call ambassadors. So these are people who we hire and um, these are folks who most of whom have, who have used Double Up or may still be using it. And we hire them to actually tell other people about it. And that means they're going to community meetings. They're going to church meetings. They're going to barber shops and beauty salons and talking about the program and everywhere they can to let people know that this is a real thing and you should use it. So uh, letting people know about the program is, is a big one. Um, I believe that one of the success factors of Fair Food Network and in general success factors of nonprofit organizations, as I did my work at Kellogg Foundation and saw many, many organizations, uh, is focus. Um, that there is so much that could be done in this area and that needs to be done, and one organization can't do it all. So we have decided at Fair Food Network that our focus is in the area of food access and affordability when it comes to the Double Up program. We are going to help build health and wealth in communities through nutrition incentives by um, focusing on access and affordability. Um, there also may be a need for the kind of education you're talking about, Mike, for um, how do I best utilize this increased bounty of produce that I'm getting? There are many other organizations that are doing a great job with that. The SNAP education organizations, um, uh, food banks and food pantries, and uh, uh, MSU Extension in every county. A lot of folks that are doing that kind of education work. So we partner with them. We say, you know, we're going to focus on what we believe we do best and can do best in the future. We're going to partner with you so you know about our program, so you have all the information you need that when we are asked about it, we can refer people to you and vice versa. Um, so we don't directly do uh, much uh, sort of cooking and preparation education. We rely on those organizations that focus on that that can do a better job than we can. Yeah, and yeah, that there is, as you said, there is so much to do within this ecosystem that it it is it is about focus. I don't I know running a business myself, you want to try to go twenty five different directions, but right. the more focused you are, the more effective you can be. I'm curious to ask a question around something that this, and I, I realize with, with what you just said, this is not directly in your scope, but it it does come to mind. And you hear the terms used often: the food deserts, food swamps, and just how like public policy on zoning and things like that really dictate access. Uh, maybe to the extent you have perspective on that, like talk about that. I mean, we have communities that you know, their best option for some people to shop at is the local. 7-Eleven or the local right. party store, and they don't even right. have fruits and vegetables. So, you know, to what extent does that need to be addressed? And what do you think about how that can best be addressed from your perspective? Something that um, I've thought a lot about, and we thought a lot about at Fair Food Network. Um, I actually don't really like the term food desert. I don't use it. The reason is that the way it was created was basically a looking at the average distance between a home and a supermarket. Um, and then, uh, you know, if the average distance between home and supermarket in certain areas versus the average distance between home and like a fast food restaurant in those same neighborhoods was beyond a certain amount, it would get stamped as a food desert. Mm. The reason I don't like it, Mike, is that because it is a, uh, it is a term that presupposes the solution. 
Mm -hmm. It says, oh, well, the solution to that would be put a grocery store there. And um, then it wouldn't be a food desert. And there's been pretty good research now that shows us that simply locating a grocery store, and usually it's a grocery store that has a headquarters somewhere else, you know, in Cincinnati or Grand Rapids or somewhere else, or um, Bentonville, Arkansas, and you plop that grocery store, you build it and plop it in the middle of a neighborhood that has not had a grocery store, and then research is done on uh, buying and eating habits, they don't change very much. Mm. So, you know, the, the idea about doing that in order for people to change their purchasing and eating habits to consume more fruits and vegetables doesn't work. Um, so what I think about is how do we support what I consider to be the more self-determination approach for healthy food access in communities? Let me give you an example. North Flint is a neighborhood um, that uh, lost its last Kroger store over a decade ago, has had no major grocery store there. There's a couple small markets on the outskirts of that neighborhood, but that's even tough to get to. Um, there is a very dynamic uh, pastor uh, of a church, Pastor Reginald Flynn in North Flint, and he brought together, uh, this was sort of right as the water crisis was happening in Flint, brought together the community and basically said, okay, there's, there's a lot we need to do in this community. And of course, getting rid of the lead pipes is one of them. What else do we need to do? And the outcry for a retail outlet for healthy food was the loudest voice he heard. But what he also heard was, we want that to be owned and controlled by the community. Mm. We don't want another Kroger or Walmart to come in here, and then when they decide that they're not making enough money, they leave again. That's not what we want. We want something that we can actually benefit from and control. So, um, you know, if if all goes as we expect, by the end of the summer, there's going to be a groundbreaking on the North Flint Food Cooperative. That is a new food co-op that is literally owned by the community. You can the community members buy shares in that co-op. And we are helping them get all of the financing they need to do it, all the business assistance they need to open a grocery store. They've got a great manager who really knows retail grocery. And um, that's going to be a, a place where there's going to be offerings of healthy food for the neighborhood. And by the way, Double Up Food Bucks is going to be part of the DNA of that store from the day it opens to help draw business in because a lot of the residents there do have bridge cards. It'll help draw business in and it will help um, folks access more fruits and vegetables for their homes, for their diets in that neighborhood store. So when I think about um, solutions, to me, that, that again is a living, breathing example of the kind of solution that I believe is going to work and going to be longer lasting um, than um, trying to position grocery stores in food deserts. Yeah, it, it, it is interesting. That's a perspective I hadn't taken on it before. It does, it, it absolutely presupposes the solution to the problem when you say that. And it seems like this, the theme keeps coming up through our conversation of just you know, local local ownership, right. uh, local buy-in, that, that grassroots effort that really makes a difference in, in an initiative like this. Right, you, you, I mean, if the community supports it, and builds it and um, owns it, it's going to last. So to that end, you know, people are, I think as people listen to this, and again, most of our listeners are, are people who are in the, the health sciences, not necessarily the, the people that would be you know, using the Double Up Food Bucks program. Right. But as people are listening to this and they're saying, well, this makes all the sense in the world. Like we need to get healthier food to people that don't have access to it. Because on a lot of levels, you know, that is that is medicine. You know, healthy food is medicine, exercise right. is medicine. I think that's something you and I have talked about many times. As people are listening to this and they're moved by what you're saying, what can people do to help advance this cause? So uh, um, I'll give you a really direct one for anybody who's who's listening, 
who can, uh, there's something we need help with. And that is, uh, you know, this has been a public private partnership. It's largely been a partnership between um, private and community foundation and individual donors, federal government, state government, and then all the food retailers. The, the partner we have not yet really been able to engage with is in the healthcare sector. Mm. That we really believe there is a place at the table here uh, to engage in a conversation with um, those organizations that are putting out a lot of money to pay for health care related to chronic disease that can be better solved by eating healthier food than by taking medicine. What I like to say sort of tongue in cheek is like, you can either pay the farmer now or the doctor later. It's one or the other. And so for any healthcare um, organization or professional that's, that's really interested in working with us on how we can pay the farmer now so we're not paying the doctor later, um, we'd love to have those conversations. Um, so I, I think, you know, there's probably some folks listening to this podcast that uh, are in that category. And um, so can I can I give them my email address? Yeah, well, what, what I'll even do one better on that, we're going to we'll link up in the show notes um, to this episode, all the contact information for, for you and Fair Food, just so people can reach out directly. But excellent. You said it. You and and I'll I'll add to your statement that I'm sure you would agree with. You could either pay the farmer far less now, or pay the doctor far more in the future. That's not right. The, not the least of which to say is the cost of the human suffering that comes when you're paying the doctor more in the future. Right. Yeah. That's it. Is it is is the 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 seat the seat at that table? No pun intended. When we're talking about food, is is so so critically important. Or what excites you? You 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 see this ecosystem um, on a very high level. You're involved, you know, around the country. You're obviously very passionate about what you do. W what excites you now in terms of the developments that you see going forward? I would say what what excites me the most is how much activity is happening at the local level versus when I first started this work. Um, you know the the um, recognition that um, spending the time and effort to find locally sourced food of every kind and how important that is um, really excites me. It, it excites me to think about how uh, our food system can hold the solution for so many of the issues we're facing, um, whether it be climate change, and environmental issues, whether it be the skyrocketing cost of healthcare, which is probably going to bankrupt us sooner than anything else, whether it's about education and making sure our kids are well prepared uh, to learn for the future. Um, food has a role in all of that. And it's it's exciting to me that, you know, I may have been saying this and writing about it for decades. But all I have to do is open my ears now yeah. or read the news and and it's happening all around, all around. So it's a I'm really excited that there is a movement that has that has that's building steam in this because that's what it's going to take. Um, I'm really excited that we have uh, uh, new leadership, uh, actually, U.S. Department of Agriculture that really recognizes a lot of this. Mm -hmm. Uh, and um, is already very rapidly putting steps in place that's going to help, uh, from a policy perspective, support a lot of this uh, more local, more regional. Just the fact we have a Secretary of Agriculture now who, rather than talking about food security, he's talking about nutrition security. Mm. I mean, that's, you know, just that, just that one turn of phrase starts giving us a whole different idea that it's not just about loading people up with calories. You know, this is about actually making sure we all have the right nutrition for a healthy life. And I know you understand that well, given the profession you're in. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I love that. It's again, it seems like a, a very, very subtle difference, but it's such a critical difference because there are a lot of people who are actually probably food secure, but very nutritionally insecure in, in our mm-hmm. society. And, and that leads to that, those, that whole host of chronic diseases that we know are, are as you said, if we don't get a control of them, are, are going to bankrupt us. Well, I definitely link up to everything in the show notes in terms of how to get in contact with you, but just to, to put it out there so people can hear it, if people want to find out more about Fair Food and you, uh, where's the easiest place to go to find out that information? So the easiest place is uh, fairfoodnetwork.org. Perfect. You'll get it all right there. Um, easy easy spot to go. We've it's a, it's a great website that gives you lots of information about the organization, links to our programs like Double Up like the Fair Food Impact Initiative. Um, and, you know, we, we always welcome uh, engagement from our community. We always welcome uh, contacts from folks. Um, love to hear from people about their ideas and uh, love to hear from folks who um, are inspired to support the work. Absolutely. And we'll link up to the, that website, as well as your email in the show notes. And uh, I'll also say uh, Fair Food is a great uh, newsletter that you can subscribe to. I get that, which keeps you kind of updated uh, to your inbox as far as what's going on. And it's a, uh, it is very, it's very uh, enjoyable from my perspective to watch the, the growth that you do, particularly given my exercise background. This is kind of the yin to my yang in the sense right. that you're, you're addressing the other side of the coin. I think a lot of, a lot of people listening will will definitely resonate with that. Well, I'm going to leave you with one last question. It's the question that is is really the title of our podcast, and it's probably the hardest question I've asked you so far. So uh, no no pressure on ending it with a, a mic drop here or anything. But um, the, the Wellness Paradox, this podcast, is all about the gap between what we know as a health sciences community and what we actually do. And, and there's a gap that exists. Sometimes I feel like despite all we know, the, the gap might be getting a little bit wider. Uh, if you had one piece of advice for people in the health science community as to how to close off the gap between what we know and what we do, what would that piece of advice be? That's a great question. And um, a lot of times it's not just a matter of what we know, but it's a matter of what we have access to and where who has the opportunity and who doesn't? So I would say, you know, closing the wellness gap may not be all that much different than clo- than the gaps I talked about early on in this show. Closing the, the gap between who has access to healthy food and who doesn't. Closing the gap between who has access to the resources you need to grow a healthy food business and who doesn't. And my belief is that as we close the health and wealth gaps in that way, we have a chance to actually um, get closer to bringing what we know into the practice of what we do. Absolutely. Such a, such a great point. The quote that's kept coming to mind during this for me is I think it's the Gandhi quote that health is the first wealth. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I think I'm quoting the, the right person there. If I, I've got that wrong, I apologize, but that's just what keeps coming to mind. And that closing off the gap by access, I think is a, is a great, it embodies the, the very thing that you do at Fair Food. And I, I think that's a great way for us to close. So Oren, Thank you so much for your time. This has been a a tremendous conversation. Thank you for all the amazing work you're doing at Fair Food. And everyone who's listening, please check it out in the show notes, support Fair Food, reach out to Oren if you have any thoughts or resources that could be helpful. And Oren, we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. And thanks for the opportunity for the conversation. Really enjoyed it. Well, I truly hope you enjoyed that conversation with Oren Hesterman as much as I did. If you found this podcast valuable and insightful, please share with your friends and colleagues. Those shares really do make a difference to us. For more information on this episode and anything we touched on, please go to the show notes page at wellnessparadoxpod.com forward slash episode seven. Be on the lookout for next week's episode when it drops on Wednesday. And don't forget to subscribe through your favorite podcast platform. Until we chat again, please 
be well.